This is the city of Ordos. It was originally built for one million inhabitants. Today, it completely remains empty. Nobody lives there. It's a ghost town. And this is Zaatari from Jordan. It's a refugee camp installed by the UN for the refugees uh, from Syria. And over the three years, 100,000 Syrians have been living here, it, which makes it actually one of the fastest growing refugee camps in the world. Right after the containers were handed out to the people or laid out according, according to the grid that the UN actually installed, uh, Syrians came up with these wheels. Do you know what these wheels are for? To actually bring the containers to the locations that they think is the right one. So the, they, were, they are tribal people, they, were, they are trying to connect their families, so what they did was inventing these wheels and pulling their homes to the locations that they want. And this is Sesenia from Spain. We don't have to go that far to Jordan or uh, China. It's also here, right, in, in the Western Europe. Uh, it, this is a settlement uh, costing billions to its investors. Also is a ghost town. Nobody lives here. So I have been talking about these three settlements from different parts of the world. Do you know what do, what do they have in common? <laughs> the common thing is that their developers were thinking they're powerful enough to pursue their own plans without interacting with anyone during the process. No stakeholder, nobody involved. So imagine you're building a city area for one million people and nobody comes to live there. Can you imagine, can anybody calculate what does actually that cost to the environment, to the society, you know, to, to our economies? And the question, another question, actually, who's going to pay for that? Who is the, who, I mean, our tax bunnies? Who else, who's going to pay for it? So I want you to remember this story, I will come back to this. <coughs> I'm originally from Istanbul. I mean, if you're a tourist in Istanbul, it's great, it's a beautiful city. You come there, you look at the long history, the mosques and the, um, I mean, the bazaars and, and the Bosporus, everything is fine. But if you're a young architect, ambitious as me, you might have a slight problem. I mean, it's a mega city, it's growing quite fast, and then you're trying to find your role in it, and you're kind of unemployed because the whole thing goes by itself and nobody asks to urban, urban planners, hey, what actually we need to do here? So the next thing you do is kind of collect your stuff and come to a place where designers are taken seriously. In my case, it was the TU Delft. So in my imagination, TU Delft was a place where the, the founding fathers of urban planning, Jakob Bakema, Aldo van Eyck, they were, they were teaching in TU Delft, and there I was, and I could learn all about urban planning and probably also be influential later when I was graduating. So it was all head spinning. I was learning how the Dutch were crafting their cities. I was hearing about Delta Works. I was hearing about this endless network of bicycles covering the country. Even the highways were crowned by bicycle bridges like this one. And also don't forget the house, social housing achievement the Dutch have. I mean, they have affordable, good, good quality housing that was actually, I think to a certain extent, delivered to a big part of society, and actually they were built by star architects as well. So there I was graduating from urban design department of TU Delft, and I was even asked to stay to further do my PhD. And as I was asking further questions, with more critical questions, I was realizing this, there was a mismatch. There was a mismatch of this glorious story of architects on one side, and then what was actually happening on the ground was the questions that are being asked now in the 21st century, and maybe we were needing a different answer that we had before. So I was realizing that 15% of the offices were empty. So imagine offices being built in Amsterdam, in the center of Amsterdam, and no one, no one is using it. So they, at the same time, there's a housing crisis in the country. And there were master plans taken on hold one after another. This one is a striking one because it's at the center of Amsterdam. It's a formal shell area. This ambitious plan was made, and today, after 15 years, this is what we have in, East, in Amsterdam, the center of the city. So trying to understand where the magic was gone, or what was happening, I think this image was telling a lot. So this is the hand of an expert, hand of a master architect, showing or it, it, like kind of dictating to the rest of the society how we should live, where we should have our homes, where we should start our businesses, where we should entertain ourselves. Well, it was a model, it worked, but probably it wasn't working anymore. So, 
how would, we, how would I do it differently? I was thinking that we needed a method, a method that could actually bring more hands together, that would bring more minds together so we can actually make visions all together for our cities and not only make visions but also kind of find a way to implement them. My answer was city gaming. But what is city gaming? So we know that the reality out there is pretty complex. It's for us very important to, to grasp the complexity of cities. And in the beginning, at first hand, that's why we were trusting experts to actually help us plan them, right? And there is a way to approach the complexity of the reality. We most of the times do this. We try to simplify it. We try to make abstractions. We try to build models so we can pick certain part of the reality and start actually building knowledge on that model. So we can, we can start making solutions and implement back to the reality. Let's take a real case. So we are back in Amsterdam center, and this is the complex question we have. What we are doing is trying to kind of simplify it, simplify where the solutions have to go, build a model, so we can start playing around it. But the game is not yet there. Because we need the players. Without the players, we can't play. In the old model, this would be the big player who is trying to identify and solve the question for the rest of us. It's not a game. You need more players to play. So you need entrepreneurs that will come in big and small. Small, also in this case, big developers also can be part of the game. Or the citizens, <coughs> contractors, investors, activists, and us architects. We are still in the game. So what we try to do is try to identify all the stakeholders and try to understand how they are, how they are relating to one another, their power relations, how much money they got, how much power of rules and regulations they have, how much time do they have, how much skills and networks do they have so they can actually start being part of the game. So this is actually how we build uh, our games also, try to understand how in reality people interrelate to each other and then put that into the model so we can play it. I think this is very important, try to understand who are the stakeholders and when to involve them. And if you don't know, if you actually don't do it, in reality, this is, this is what happens. You get angry stakeholders, angry citizens on the street asking, what are you doing? In this case, it's a Stuttgart Einen Swansik project. It's a, it's a large train station project. It blew up into nationwide protests, months of uh, media coverage people asking why their, why, why their own tax money was spending in, in such a way that they actually had no idea about. And this can be avoided, to my mind, actually pretty easily. Just talk to people. Talk to people in time, not later. Talk and, and actually not only talk and inform them, to actually to be able to use their minds. They are, that, that's the value. You have to be, I think you, and we, have, we are in need of these models to be able to bring people's intelligence into making plans and implementing them. So here in, in Amsterdam North, we brought together, I mean, the, the guy at the, the very right hand, in your right, Han Michel, it's a, it's a well-known developer in the city, together with the city, city sociologist, Arnold Reindorf, the, the citizens from the area, the city, local architects like Hans Vermeulen, but also activists like Klar Lippe. So they would come, and the real players would come around the table and start playing out the scenarios that actually are going to happen. And taking games seriously for dead serious issues like in this one is nothing new. That has been done in other sectors. And my question is, why don't we take games seriously for making cities? So I have been doing this together with my PhD. First it started as a theoretical project, now it is becoming uh, a method, a working method that's going around the world since the last seven years. And I could actually go back to Istanbul now with my method and start talking and become part of the conversation. And I, you remember this in organic growing parts of the city, right now there's big interest going on in those areas. There's big transformation pr pressure on those, on those areas because, because, because big investors, big money is coming in on the, on the one side. On the other side, the politi politics wants to be involved and also there's the citizens and their, their neighborhoods are being demolished and changed. So it's, imagine this polarized environment where people hardly say hi to each other. They kind of 
the stigmatized environment. And city gaming is one of the last resorts to bring people in one gaming room so they can start talking about the issues that they have been avoiding to talk with each other. Another case from Cape Town. In the largest township that's called Kailicha, we were asked by the city of Cape Town to convince the formal investors to come in and invest. So this is the center of Kailicha. It's a one million township. Um, and it, the center looks like this. It's a container, basically informal container market. And no investor will ever come here if they don't see this happening, if they don't see the regulators talking with the community, community talking with the, with the planners, and, and, and having this conversation so that they actually can take the risk to come in. And not only the formal investors, but also informal traders w would find themselves in this scheme. This is a lady, she's selling chicken during the day, and when thrown into the game, she could actually come in, not only talk, but also visualize what she thinks or what she expects from the future of the area. Here, in another session, you see the Capetonians building up future narratives for the future of their cities. And I would, I would call this a, a magic. I mean, this is, this, this is a plan that was developed over four game sessions. More than 100 people joined these sessions to build a common plan. Imagine you have 100, 120 people having all these different interests, but they are able to come up to a consensus to one plan. I don't think there will be street protest in Kailiche when this plan is being implemented. So we know that these top-down imposed ideas, whether it be China or in Europe, they don't work. Sooner or later, they explode. And we don't have to go that far to see that we need innovative solutions for our urban questions. This is the center of Delft, the, uh, the question we have at the train station. Imagine we played a city game where we understood at least what is the budget, how much we can realize, what are our urgencies that we could decide together. I think that all over the world there are so many more questions that the city gaming can be meaningful. And I believe that city gaming is one of the valid answers to the questions of 21st century urban planning. I hope one day we could play all together so that we can plan our cities all together. Thank you very much. <laughs>